and start to you say in faith there is victory. Where is your heart? Thank you for tuning in to Focus on Faith with your host, Russ Vickers. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Focus on Faith. I'm your host, Russ Vickers, minister for the Hillcrest Church of Christ in Baldwin, Mississippi. And we're delighted to have you back here today, and we appreciate you tuning in to our program so very much. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take it out as we're going to be studying today. And today we have Brother Russ Earl from the Ulaga Church of Christ in uh, Oklahoma, and he is going to be talking about decision-making. And each and every day, we get up and we make decisions about our lives. So without anything further, Russ, go ahead and begin, please. Today we're looking at decision-making. As we think about decision-making, we know sometimes people base how they make their decisions upon what their mother or father has told them in years past. Sometimes we hear phrases such as, well, if it doesn't hurt anyone, it's, it's okay. Or just do what you think is best. But we know the world has different ideas and standards upon how they make their decisions. In fact, many times I'll tell you there is no right or wrong way to make a decision. In fact, they tell you that there is no right or wrong in anything. But we want to look at what the Bible says concerning making godly decisions, making right decisions. How do we make decisions in such a way that's pleasing to God? Ask yourself for a moment if when it comes time for you to make a decision, do you stop and pray to God? Do you contemplate what the Bible has said on whatever decision is you're contemplating? Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. Here the Bible says in Hebrews 5 and verse 14, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This means that there is evil in the world and that there is good in the world, but those who have exercised their mind and, and studied God's Word enough, they can discern, that is, they can tell the difference between what is good and what is evil. And so we want to make sure that when we are making decisions, that we make them in a way that is, first of all, pleasing to God, and that the choice we make also is pleasing to God. And so let's think about good and evil, because we know again today there are those who argue that there is no such thing as good and evil. There's only your decision, and it, so there is no good or evil in their minds. Many are against any attempt to classify good and evil. But you'll notice here, as we just read in Hebrews 5 and verse 14, that there is good and evil. You'll notice he says that solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who are mature. Solid food will be those teachings of God that are beyond basic principles. And he says in verse 14, that is, that those who by reason of use, that is, those who are experienced, those who know God's Word well enough, they can discern, he says in verse 14, both good and evil. They have read God's Word enough studied God's Word enough to recognize what is good and what is evil. So who determines what is good and what is evil? Well, God determines what is good and evil. Not man, not the world, and definitely not media, but God determines what is right and what is wrong. He determines what is good and what is evil. Right and wrong for many is, a, is different to every person. What is right to you may be wrong to this person. What is wrong to you may be right to that person. And so we cannot base our standards of right and wrong upon man because it is shifting sand that moves back and forth, forward and back. And so we cannot base what is right and wrong upon what man believes is right or wrong. Some say there is no absolute right and wrong. Some say that you cannot know what is right or what is wrong, what is good or what is evil. There is no absolute way to determine so. Well, the Bible tells us that is not correct. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 14, in looking at Proverbs 14, in looking at verse 12, we find the Bible has much to say about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. In Proverbs 14, and looking at verse 12, let's notice together what God's Word has said. In Proverbs 14 and verse 12, 
Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. This tells us that, the, he knows what he says here, there is a way that seems right to man. There is a way that man looks upon things and says, well, okay, that is right or that is wrong or that's just fine. There is no good or evil. But he says in verse 12, the way of man that seems right to man, he says its end is the way of death. That means the result of thinking like the world ends in death. If we think like the world and live like the world and based our decisions like the world, the end result is spiritual death. And so we cannot base what is right and wrong, what is good and, or evil, upon the world's standards. And so let's also notice now that right and wrong is not just a matter of personal thinking. The battle today is men change what is right to fit them. And that cannot be the case because we know the Bible has set in stone what is right and wrong. Some things are sinful and some things are righteous. Some things are found on the ways or on the path of life, and some things are found on the path of eternal damnation. And so there is a difference between right and wrong, good and evil. And we find this idea throughout the Bible. We find that good and evil is spoken of in Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, looking at verse 23, we find that the Bible gives us an idea concerning good and evil, but it's concerning right and wrong. In Psalm 37 and verse 23, here the Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Well, what, are, what makes this man a good man? Because his ways are the ways of God. He says he, his, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That is, they are put in place by the Lord. He follows God, and so his steps are literally in line with God. You know, we think about Enoch, who was taken, who did not see death because he was a man who had this reputation that he pleased God. That literally means that he was in step with God. He walked with God because he was pleasing to God. And we find here that a man, a good man, his steps are ordered by the Lord, and the Lord delights in his way because he follows the ways of God. Well, let's think about biblical failures in making decisions. We know that there are arrogance, there is arrogance in society. For instance, we find in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11, the story or the illustration of the woman who was stoned, who wanted, or those who wanted to stone her because she was caught in adultery. But you'll notice in John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11, that only the woman was accused. Only the woman was brought forth and cast onto the ground to be stoned. Where was the man? He was guilty as well, wasn't he? We find that society is arrogant and wrong by their judgments time and time again. And we find in John 8 that Christ tells her to go and sin no more. Not that she had done no sin, but that she was to sin no more. Stop doing that action. We find the rich man, he was called a fool in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. How he was smart enough to make a living, but too foolish to have eternal life. The Bible tells us he had many possessions, and he had so much he had to tear down a barn and build more. And after he had done so, the Lord called him a fool and told him, Tonight your life is required. And then what's going to happen to what you have left? As you look at Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. Well, we know that all those things that rich fool had would go to someone else that would not follow him in the afterlife. And so he made a, a poor decision. He made a wrong decision. We would say he made an evil one because it separated him from God. The Pharisees who tried to trap Jesus on numerous occasions tried also in Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. We know the Pharisees wanted to trap Christ. Their motives were evil and their decisions to do such things were evil. They were wrong. They were not righteous. They were not good. They were not pleasant. They had no desire for truth, and so their decision was wrong. Their decision was evil to try to trap Christ in that way, as we see in Matthew 22. Well, let's look at some guides for, for making good decisions, for making, we might say, biblical decisions. When we say biblical decisions... We mean we make decisions that are based upon what God has said. 
We make decisions because God's word says that is good, that is fine, it's not sinful to do that. And so that is a biblical decision. Well, let's notice Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, and let's look at verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 11, verses 24 and 25. When we think about biblical decisions, we know that if something is a biblical decision, it cannot be a worldly one. And so where one is true, the opposite also is true. A biblical decision is based upon God's word and not upon the ideas of the world. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. Here the Bible tells us, verses 24 and 25, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice verse 25, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That was a righteous decision, wasn't it? It was a godly decision in that it was pleasing to God. He chose to suffer with the faithful rather than to enjoy the, he says, the passing pleasures of sin. And how true it is, the pleasures of sin are so temporary, they're short-lived. You know, so many times we go and we see the, the new items at a store that are placed outside. It used to be when you, they see them placed for instance, grills outside in front of a store, that they left them outside for a season. That even those who were still on sale, those grills would start to rust. And it took no time at all before those things started to decay. And so are the pleasures of this world. It doesn't take long before they too begin to decay. Well, let's think about, again, how we make godly decisions. We know we must have faith in God. That's our first step for making godly and biblical decisions, is to have faith in God. And Moses, we find here, is a great example of that. Another characteristic or guide for making godly decisions is a love for God. If we don't love God, we're not going to make godly decisions. A love for God should lead us to righteous choices. Notice John 14 and verse 23. In John 14, and looking at verse 23, here the Bible says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We see that because God, because God loves man, he loves man because we keep God's word. And if we love God, we will keep His Word. And that includes that we will follow God's commands as we make our decisions. And so when we make our decisions, they are based upon God's Word because we love God, we respect God, and we do not want to make a decision that is not pleasing to Him. And so another guide or another characteristic for godly biblical decisions is a love for God. Another is courage. It takes courage to make biblical and righteous decisions. Let's notice Matthew chapter 10. If we're going to make a decision, we must have the courage to stand behind that decision. Because as soon as we make it, if it's pleasing to God, many times we have those who sadly will not be pleased with it. And so for that reason, we have to stand behind our decisions. Matthew 10 and verse 28 says, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so if we want to make godly decisions, we have to have the courage to stand behind it. And that's what Christ is telling us here as well. We cannot fear the world because they're going to attack us when we make godly, righteous decisions. And so we must stand behind them and realize, you know what? There are some who are not going to like this, but I'll make the decision and do it and stand behind it because it's pleasing to God, and that's what matters most. We also must realize we must use caution when making decisions. Godly decisions lead us to God, but ungodly ones separate us from God. Notice Proverbs chapter 23. In Proverbs chapter 23, in Proverbs 23, and looking with me at verse 3, Proverbs 23 and verse 3 says, Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Well, what is he talking about? Do not desire whose delicacies? The delicacies of the wicked one, or the wicked people of this world. The Bible also tells us, Do not be envious of evil men. Do not be jealous of them. 
And so we cannot make decisions because, we're, because we are not popular enough. Sometimes people make decisions because they want to become more popular. They want to be in a certain clique or in a certain group. But we must use caution because not only is that a wrong reason to make a decision, but it could result in a decision that separates us from God. And so let us not be fooled into making poor decisions. Let's also notice our final guide for godly decisions and making biblical decisions. Those are pleasing to God. We must investigate, think about our decisions, and look into it, see if it really is going to be pleasing to God, and see if it's a decision that we need advice on from other godly and sound brethren around us who could help us in making a good and right decision. We must investigate and not blindly accept anything. Acts 17 verse 11 tells us this, that those individuals there studied the Word of God daily, and they made sure that what they heard was right. That was their decision to do so. Sadly, some did not do that. But let's not be like that. Let's be like those of Acts 17, of the Bereans who were faithful, who were noble-minded because they searched the Word of God. They made a right decision. They investigated into things. A wise person investigates before making a decision. Notice Proverbs chapter 13. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 13. In Proverbs 13, and looking at verse 16. In Proverbs 13 and verse 16, the Bible says, Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. A prudent man acts with knowledge. That is, a prudent man acts based upon knowledge. He doesn't hastily make a decision and and go all in, he stops, he thinks, he considers, he investigates, he implies or employs rather all those steps we have mentioned already, and thus he is a prudent man. He uses knowledge, he makes decisions based upon knowledge, not upon just going quickly to do something and to get it over with, and because the result many times is a poor decision. And so we must be like the prudent man as we find here in Proverbs 13, 16, who acts with knowledge because we are warned that a fool lays open his folly. Many times a fool is clearly seen by their poor decisions. So as we close today, let's consider that decisions are not always easy and they're not always simple. You know, it's easy to decide, if I'm, am I going to stop at this red light? Well, yes, we're going to do that. But sometimes it's not easy for people to decide they're going to get up on a Sunday morning to worship God. That's a decision, too. For some, it's simple, and some, it's not. But in all, all of our decisions, let us make sure that they are based upon biblical principles and based upon God's Word. Thank you. Russ, thank you so much. Appreciate that lesson. You did a great job on it. And as I said earlier, at the introduction to our program today, we get up out of bed and we make decisions about everything. And in fact, getting out of bed is a decision that we make every single day. Um, whether to lay in bed, hit the snooze bar, or whether to get up and be about our day. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20, we read this, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. And the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. What would happen if you were in the same valley of decision between these two mountains. Every day, God gives us the freedom to make choices. And what we do during the day in making these choices affects our future. We can make choices for good or we can make them for evil. And He gives us the freedom to make the choices about what we think is going to be good or even best for us. The Israelites had to make a choice. If you remember back in Joshua 
chapter 24, verse 15. And this is a verse that we know so very well about decision making. It is a verse that we have probably in pictures on our walls, in cross stitch or some other form to remind us of who rules our homes. Is it God or is it something else or someone else? Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, keep something in mind. You're not free not to choose. To decide not to choose is a choice. Does that make sense? To decide not to choose good is always a choice to choose evil. And in choosing evil, we have to reap the consequences of our decision. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30 says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's a true statement by the Lord. You're not free to choose the consequences of your choice. Well, here's an illustration that might help. Stand beside an open window on the 10th floor. You have a choice whether to jump out of that window or stay exactly where you are. And this is without anybody hindering you or standing in your way. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay where you're at? Or are you going to jump? If you jump, you will reap the consequences of that decision. And jumping from a 10th story floor is not exactly the wisest thing to do, is it? James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God has chosen you that you might choose Him. Now that's why we're called His elect. We love Him because He first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we read this. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now there's some things that we need to keep in mind also, that the day of choice is coming to an end. There will be a day where we will not be able to choose anymore between good and evil, between God and this world. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make choices for God. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he may be near. Don't think that you have forever to make up your mind whether you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ or not. Choose Jesus because in him are all spiritual blessings found. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and following. You can know immediate joy, Philippians 4.4. 4. To rejoice in the Lord is something we need to be doing every single day. There is a possibility that you may pass away tonight. What choices are you going to make today? Jesus Christ is coming back. Matthew 24, verse 44. And each time you decide against Him, you harden your heart. Hebrews 3 and verse 15. 
Oh yes, we make choices every day. We make choices whether to read the Bible or not. We make choices whether to pray or not. We make choices whether to be busy about the work of the Lord or not. I know that schedule, that we have schedules and we have lives and that we have a, a lot of things going on with the kids and with our families and with our friends. But can't we choose to take time for the Lord each and every day? Why not be a daily Bible reader? Pray to the Lord often during the day. What are you choosing today? Has the Word of God softened you or has it hardened your heart? Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And notice verse 41 with me of Acts chapter 2. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what are we choosing? Are we choosing God? Are we choosing Satan? Satan wants you very badly to choose him. And God wants all to come to repentance and choose him and obey the gospel message. Friends, each and every day we're making decisions that determine destiny. And we thank you so much for watching this program. And as always, remember, I want you to focus on faith. And that, too, is a choice that you can make. May God bless. Where there is victory, where is your heart?